Welcome to our final pointer seminar of the semester on sustaining a global independent nonprofit media organization in the 21st century. I'm Thomas Pogge, director of the Yale Global Justice Program, one of the sponsoring organizations of this event, alongside the Yale Pointer Fellowship in Journalism, which has been supporting the visit to Yale this semester of our moderator Khadija Sharif as a Pointer Fellow. Based in South Africa, Khadija Sharif is an award-winning investigative journalist and senior editor for Africa at Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Sharif is the former director of the Platform for the Protection of Whistleblowers and currently also a board member of Finance Uncovered. She has worked with forums including the Pan-African Parliament, the African Union, the OECD, and the UN Environmental Programme. Her work is focused on illicit financial flows, natural resources, and political economy. She is the author of Texas, If You Can, Africa. Adita will introduce today's topic, as well as our treasured guests, Marina Walker Guerrera, executive editor of the Pulitzer Center and a driving force behind the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, Paul Radu, a co founder and chief of innovation at OCCRP and Miranda Patricic, OCCRP's Deputy Editor-in-Chief for Central Asia. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, once upon a time, as stories go, there was a freelance journalist who couldn't get a job, so he took low-level a clerkship in a British shipping company. They had landed a very big contract with the European government to handle African trade and humanitarian and donor support. But as time goes by, this journalist uh, slash clerk begins to notice that the trade data going out of Europe shows a massive export of weapons and mercenaries uh, going to one particular African country. And it also shows a very lucrative import from that African countries of resources like timber, rubber, ivory, and live cargo that had a high mortality rate. So he notices that a lot of the times they're just throwing this live cargo overboard. And from there, it would go off in different directions. So he raises it to his bosses who said, settle down chap, you know, this is above your pay grade. We need to keep the profit going. But they started keeping an eye on him, watching what he would do and having him followed uh, because this was a very big market share at the time, 30% of the market. He couldn't get into it, the, the story that he had found this data into big media because a lot of the media finances and owners were patrons and philanthropists who also had skin in the trade game. So he created his own little thing called the West Africa Mail and as he was writing and slowly uncovering things, um, the people on the ground would make copies of it and they started circulating it. And people who worked within the system began to have their conscience triggered, including a civil servant who started sending him evidence. And from there, civil society, the human rights activists, parliamentarians took it up and began to make legislative change. That story sounds a lot like what happens today, but it's actually the story of King Leopold's brutal conquest of the Congo through his private company, the Congo Free State, where he held shares through 33 proxies, including his own personal doctor. There was the usual propaganda from Henry Morton Stanley. Today's version would be the Bell Pottingers, the story of slavery, wildlife poaching for ivory and rubber for Europe's automobile revolution. There was also the element of private mercenaries, the force public. So Leopold made a private fortune of over a billion dollars. The shipping companies that were private and legitimate corporations made a lot of money. Plantation owners traded their cotton, their sugar and tobacco for slaves. And the banks who provided secret settlements and credits did the same. So that story is something that happens all the time today. Corporate predation, mercenaries, trafficking, shell companies. The rubber of old is now cobalt for the Congo's uh, massive supply that goes into renewable energy like um, Elon Musk's Tesla. So whenever we have a so-called progressive revolution, it might in fact rely on the old bloody ways. But there's also this other side, which was a resourceful journalist, sources who are triggered by the truth. And what happens when you put that truth on the record, the momentum that builds. But unlike the past, the journalist of today is almost, that sounds like the white noise in my head. <laughs> Unlike the past, the journalists of today are almost hunters in their own right. Instead of reacting, they anticipate, 
They've developed data and knowledge hubs that cross borders, that rival even that of intelligence agencies. They are very resilient. You can see that in the Forbidden Stories project. And much of this is due to the cross-border collaboration between journalists rather than the usual competition of the Me First movement that puts the individual at the expense of society, which is the basis of capitalism and why all this bad stuff happens in the first place. So the architects of that brave and beautiful investigative journalism world are with us today. Our first speaker, let me just read this to get it right, is Marina Walker, the executive editor of the Pulitzer Center. For the past 14 years, she was largely at the helm of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, a network of global reporters in more than 90 countries. She managed the two largest collaborations in journalism history, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, which involved hundreds of journalists using technology to unravel stories of public interest from leaked financial data. She was instrumental in developing ICIJ's model of large-scale media collaboration, which amplified their reach and impact. A native of Argentina, her investigations have won uh, more than 25 national and international awards, in, uh, including the Pulitzer Prize. After Marina's presentation, we'll go to a question and answer with Miranda Petruchik and Paul Radu. Miranda is the deputy editor-in-chief for Central Asia. She most recently worked on the award-winning plunder and patronage in the heart of Central Asia and the Matrimov Kingdom investigations. This resulted in protests that brought down the government in Kyrgyzstan. She's worked on investigations that exposed billions in telecom bribes in Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan and revealed a $1.2 billion arms trade between Europe and the Gulf that fueled conflict in the Middle East and exposed ties between organized crime, corruption, government, and business in Montenegro. Paul Radu uh, is the founder of OCCRP and its chief of innovation. He leads OCCRP's major investigative projects, scopes regional expansion, and develops new strategies and technology to expose organized crime and corruption across borders. Paul initiated the award-winning Russian, Azerbaijani, and Troika laundromat investigations and coined the term laundromat to defi define large-scale, all-purpose financial fraud vehicles that are used to launder billions of dollars. Uh, if anybody has any questions, they could use the raise hand function to speak it, or they could write the question down in the chat box. Uh, we'll turn it over to Marina now. Thank you. I did not unmute myself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I was just thanking everyone uh, for having me, for inviting me. I'm going to um, share my screen. So, uh, Please let me know if it is working. I hope it is. Okay, um, so what I would like to do today is to um, share a little bit about how this um, brave new world of cross-border collaborative investigative journalism came to be uh, and what we learned along the way, what we're doing today. Um, first of all, I always like to start with the ode to the lone wolf and the lone wolf uh, we all have been, uh, I think that investigative journalists are, uh, traditionally have been more wired to hoard and to work in isolation. We have been the ultimate lone wolves. And, um, and to be honest, the lone wolves uh, in the past did great service to journalism. And there are some stories that still might be suited for the lone wolf. But uh, a, a great deal of stories that we're facing today, and just think about this, you know, 1MDB, FIFA, Xinjiang, big banks, uh, these stories are just too big, too global, too complex for any single journalist or single newsroom to really do justice to those stories. And so as a result of, of continuing to work in isolation, about 10 years ago, we um, in, you know, may have missed uh, parts of these stories, we may have overlapped with each other, uh, and not really do the, the job that we could have done. So we realized that, and we decided to change. We decided uh, to see um, in each other collaborators rather than competitors. And, and that, that was like a very uh, uh, paradigmatic uh, change in the profession of, of journalism. Um, and um, uh, we decided we wanted to um, really be a match to the forces that we are set to investigate. Um, and we wanted also uh, if, in that strength, be able to, um, to do better stories, to do stories that can uh, sustain the attacks that we are seeing today, that can sustain the, uh, you know, in the face of misinformation campaigns, in, this, in the face of libelous uh, lawsuits, and in the face of uh, coordinated attacks and physical attacks on journalists. 
Um, that's how the OCCRP network came about. That's how the ICIJ network came about when we decided to uh, build on this journalistic solidarity that really hadn't existed before. Um, that whole premise is built on trust, trust that is not easy to gain, that can be lost also very easily. Um, uh, a trust that we have one another's back and that uh, we share radically across borders. And when I say when I say radically, I mean like the entire Panama Papers uh, leak is shared radically with hundreds of reporters around the world. And, and we'll uh, talk about this uh, in a second. It, it's a recognition that uh, there are stories like the ones that we saw before that really transcend us, transcend our individual newsrooms, transcend uh, countries and are uh, part of the common interest or the public interest and we journalists need to be able to recognize when that is the case and do and adopt a methodology uh, that allow us to treat those stories as, as a common good uh, of public interest and it is always in the public interest to have diverse uh, journalists uh, collaborating with a deep local knowledge corruption is always first local and then together <clears throat> Uh, building that bigger global narrative together following the money across borders uh, and revealing that global truth. Um, I would uh, like to touch on the issues of whistleblowers, not only as journalists starting to create this journalistic um, solidarity, we were fortunate that uh, whistleblowers, brave whistleblowers around the world notice this trend and realized um, that this was, com this was uh, efficient for them, that maybe they could leak to a particular journalist or a media organization that was part of a network, and then uh, that information will be treated uh, as uh, by the network and will be jointly published and therefore have the possibility of having much greater impact. So before Panama Papers, we had offshore leaks, we had Luxembourg leaks and Swiss leaks and they were all driven by whistleblowers who saw this emerging trend and decided to trust journalists uh, and, and decided that this information uh, would benefit from that journalistic filter. Um, the uh, you know, so journalists together working uh, in conjunction around the, around the world. Um, but uh, at the time, many, many times, especially in the, in the beginning of these big leaks, uh, we felt like this. We felt like uh, um, we did not have uh, initially all the technology and, uh, the, and the methodology that, that would allow us to do justice to this data. Um, and we had to um, um, invent that technology, not that we um, uh, build everything from scratch, but just find smart ways to put technology at the service of, of investigative journalism. Um, and that is something that Paul and Miranda will, uh, will talk about because OCCRP has done a wonderful uh, job that, as Khadija said, really matches the technology of the intelligence services, I think, uh, but it's uh, is done for the public good. Um, so uh, at ICIJ, where I worked for many years, uh, we um, use open source technology. We adjust it to the needs of journalists and basically um, create, created a knowledge center that allowed us to process, to index uh, these millions of documents that we were getting from whistleblowers and make them available to journalists around the world. The idea being that in, with each leak thinking, uh, and, you know, can we put this uh, on online basically in a secure platform? Uh, because we were um, convinced that the best way to investigate together is for each journalist in each location to have access to the entirety of the documents and to be able from uh, their own computer to access the information, to, to filter the information, to, um, to search, uh, uh, to extract entities, to you know, um, um, use this technology powered by machine learning to be able to, um, to focus on what journalists uh, in these investigations, if we go to the very basics, focus on people, organizations, and locations, and start building those connections. Uh, that uh, also was um, an opportunity for journalists to collaborate with other professions and disciplines, something that also we hadn't done uh, very well in the past. So we started in integrating engineers, uh, data specialists, uh, and more in our newsroom. So they could uh, bring their um, uh, expertise and skills and make us better journalists. Uh, 
Then, of course, uh, the human element, you know, like uh, tools are fantastic, but uh, what really matter is, uh, is the story and, and the people. If that is not working, if, if we don't have this uh, coordinated dance where, um, you know, today, every, the entire world in the pandemic is kind of going through these virtual realities and remote teams, but investigative journalists have been doing this now for more than a decade. And, uh, and we learned um, uh, again to, to, to coordinate and to, and, to, and to stay in touch and to build on that trust uh, in, in difficult circumstances. Um, uh, for that, we um, you know, rely on some clear uh, guidelines. I never like to talk about rules, um, but just clear guidelines that keep us all on the same page uh, about confidentiality and safety about uh, the idea that uh, nobody can scoop anybody else, um, fair crediting, uh, as well as, as, as really sharing radically at each step of the research and the reporting. Um, and that, you know, this seems like pretty normal, like when we look at it, but believe me, when you have hundreds of journalists working for media organizations that put pressure on them, working in difficult environments, um, it can become really challenging, uh, even adhering to these very basic uh, uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, but when there's a, a, a sense of spirit and a, a spirit of mission, like we had when we were doing the Panama Papers, um, I think that that's, uh, that's possible. And uh, speaking of Panama Papers, these are the journalists who started that uh, game-changing investigation, Bastian and Frederick Obermeyer. Uh, and they say that sharing is the most selfish thing that we can do in journalism. In their view, um, they would have never been able to tackle the Panama Papers alone as a media organization. And by counting on this, uh, uh, on the solidarity and the work of journalists across the world uh, who benefited from a great story, and then Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, the German newspaper, benefited from the insights and the knowledge of all these journalists around the world. Um, uh, and again, an investigation that started with text messages between a whistleblower that has remained anonymous until today, luckily, uh, calls himself, herself, John Doe. And, and this is how it all started. It all started with um, uh, a, a brave whistleblower wanting to get this information out, uh, these crimes out, as he said. Uh, here in these messages. And this is the scale of the leak. This is what we were faced when we thought uh, on the left, you see like the, the size of the information that we had been handling until that moment and feeling pretty, pretty pressured. Uh, and then here comes Panama Papers and it's how many times bigger. Uh, so it really, um, it was really helpful to have been practicing for the past several years uh, with the smaller links. We felt like we had the trust was strong at that point. The technology was, uh, was pretty good. And then we just needed to scale. And Panama Papers gave us that, that, uh, that fuel and gave us uh, uh, that push to really scale and to show that, uh, that cross-border collaboration can be truly global. Um, and we needed a mighty force to do that. So here's just um, uh, a, a view of who, who was part of this effort. Um, more than, than one media in each country. And it just, just counting with one newsroom wasn't enough. That, that was the, the scale of, of the leak. Um, and also trying to bring in very diverse um, uh, media organizations uh, to be able to like uh, really guarantee that the entire story will get out. And getting together and getting together in person when that was a possibility. Uh, to strategize and to think, how do we tackle this difficult uh, story? Um, and uh, there, was a, there were a couple of things that helped us in framing uh, the story. By that time, we um, thankfully had um, understood that the story of global taxation and, and tax avoidance is, uh, is the story of inequality and is one of the most pressing and urgent stories of our time. And um, uh, that that's really what we were talking about, but we needed to really work to continue to make the case to the audience, um, how that story touches them, how that's this story touches these uh, father and son that you see here, the ordinary citizens uh, that pay taxes 
and that live in a completely different reality and have to follow completely different rules from those who benefit from this widely accepted system uh, that gives them their own rules to play by. So uh, our goal with Panama Papers and Paradise Papers was to be able to create that, um, to help people make that click and understand how in reality we are all the victims of that system. And that's why we should care. Um, and also overcome this very pervasive notion that uh, these schemes are legal, which is something that, as you know, the um, uh, accounting firms uh, that uh, lead the offshore world uh, and advise and, and profit from it um, uh, made us believe, right? Like these uh, schemes, they, they, they coined the phrase, are perfectly legal. And uh, this is uh, President Obama actually after the release of the Panama Papers uh, talking in a press conference about the significance of the leak and saying that is exactly the problem, that they are legal, that we as a society have decided uh, to, that, that this is going to be okay and accepted. Um, and that gave us also um, uh, the, the fuel, having done all of the previous leaks, to be better advocates in our own newsrooms, because even editors sometimes were telling us, why should we be um, uh, investigating this? Why should we be writing these stories if these activities are legal? And by that time, by the time of Panama Papers, I think it was much more widely accepted that precisely because they are legal and outrageous and immoral is because we need to investigate them. Uh, that is a system that is designed on purpose to be legal. Um, people also, um, we felt that um, they did make that, uh, that click. And after the Panama Papers published, we saw a huge uproar, as you remember, and you can see it here. This is Iceland. Uh, the prime minister there, I, I don't think that uh, what we found about him was an incredibly criminal, what he had done. But, uh, but, uh, but the lack of transparency um, and the, the deceit uh, was enough uh, for people to feel outraged, uh, especially after the economic crisis that hit Iceland so, so um, heavily and decided that you need uh, to go out. It's like the standards had really um, come up. Uh, they had been raised. There, there was a, a bar that had been raised. And uh, we saw that in the reaction uh, to this story and what came after that. Um, and also people realizing, uh, making that, uh, that click and realizing that uh, seeing themselves in the stories uh, and, and realizing how, um, how they were uh, victims in this uh, big global scheme. Um, uh, this figure has increased, uh, you know, so these uh, investigations and I'm sure that Miranda and Paul will talk a little bit about this and have been good for uh, Marina, we lost you. Yeah, we can't hear you, Marina. So she got disconnected. Yeah, Marina mentioned that uh, they have a strong winds and that maybe she will, um, she might be disconnected at some point. Let's hope she can come back. Uh, Miranda, could I ask you a question while Marina is trying to reconnect? You're one of the best, if not the best, forensic financial journalist in the world. How did you, or rather, why did you make a transition from the business world to the investigative journalism world? What have been some of your most difficult stories to do? And uh, what kind, what do you think that journalists need to study in order to understand the world of, of uh, financial numbers and financial crime? Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me here. So my expertise at the moment is working in Central Asia and Azerbaijan. Um, so those are countries that are, you know, run by dictators, um, country where there's no access, access to records to journalists or, um, you know, other groups 
for that matter. Uh, those are countries where um, uh, those are countries that are extremely rich, yet a, lo a large portion of population uh, is very poor. Um, and in a way, um, the people who are leading those countries are acting with full impunity. But what was what is really amazing, and it's especially because of the uh, global financial economy, uh, global financial environment, in a way it allows them to steal money, but it also in allows us to be able to report about the corruption and embezzlement and, and about um, crimes that are taking place in those countries. And the way we are able to report about them is because of the uh, financial records we are able to obtain abroad. So um, over the past of um, last decade, actually, I've been my primarily job was reporting about every other country in the world except my own country. And what we were able to uncover, you know, uh, billions and billions of dollars in corruption, thanks to the records we would obtain abroad, um, financial statements which would tell us about the, um, you know, mining license that was obtained through a bribe, um, the uh, you know major business deal that took place because. Um, of the you know joint venture with the first family in that country. So in in a way, this has been really a blessing for reporters worldwide. And it's what's what's even more important in these countries, um, you know, most journalists are uh, there are very few journalists who are uh, able to report, and they face tremendous threats. But by us exposing uh, the wrongdoings and working with them, we are basically bringing international attention. And in a way costing these regime, um, you know, their uh, reputation, money, uh, business deals, and many other things. So in a way, we are able to, as a joint international community of journalists, we are able to hold them to the account. Uh, and from my own personal perspective, I studied business. Um, and I, in, in a way, I think that, uh, you know, journalists are very often afraid of numbers. And for me, the understanding of how business works, works really helped me understand uh, how corruption works and how to follow the, the money across the borders and to recognize what is a normal business and then what is not a normal business. And I think for journalists, this is really essential. If we are investigating the you know, um, offshore world, if we're investigating tax evasion, we really do need to understand how the financial system works and how uh, accounting at the company level works or accounting at the group level works in order to be able to find these hidden transactions and hidden numbers in the data, which will help us uncover a grand corruption. I'll just give one example. Uh, when we were investigating a, a billion dollar bribe to the Aliyev family of Azerbaijan uh, from Atelier Sonera, the way we discovered it is literally in the accounts of a Dutch holding company. Um, and there was only one line uh, which listed $400 million. And I was, I saw this line and I thought, wow, this is unusual. That's a lot of, that, that's a lot of money. And basically that led us to uncover this, you know, huge corruption scheme. So I'll stop here because Marina is back and she can continue her really wonderful presentation. No, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's a strong wind uh, where I live and my internet is a little shaky. So I was uh, concluding my presentation. I just had a couple more slides to go. So I'm happy for us to continue the conversation uh, now, Khadija, and I can answer any questions. Okay, um, if, if you're sure. Uh, so, so Miranda, just continuing what you were saying, you've been teaching a journalist all around the world, forensic accounting, but unlike an accountant, you don't think in, in a silo, you think in contextual terms of crime and corruption. Do you feel that that has given you an edge over accountants in the sense that they are not anticipating the way that you can use the information that they disclose? I think it has, and I think what um, um, what uh, what is really interesting is, you know, uh, the people who are involved in grand corruption, they they spend so much time covering their tracks, but at the same time, um, they leave traces like the little crumbles that we from time to time um, see and are able to do a big investigation. You know, one example I can use is, you know, in Azerbaijan, the first family, and this is a story we did as part of Panama Papers, Azerbaijan ruling family got the big gold mine. And of course, there was no record available um, 
um, in Azerbaijan. They uh, structured the company through, um, you know, different companies in Nevis and Seychelles, so like a very notorious offshore jurisdiction. And then they have one single company in UK. And just by looking at the UK uh, company, we were able to reconstruct the whole business, find out how much they invested, find out where the money came from, from their own bank, find out how much gold they got. And it was literally like a tiny line, you know, a few numbers in a financial statement in, a, in, in, in a one country that allowed us to do that. Um, I, I've been teaching reporters, but the way I teach reporters is from the perspective of the story we can tell from the accounts of certain companies. I always think about it, I, you know, what I'm not looking is different ratios. I'm not looking how profitable the company is. What I'm looking is, you know, these are the questions we wanna ask. So when we look at financial statements, you know, what does this company own? You know, very basic question, but you know, yeah. does it own a facility? Does it own a property? What does it own? You know, where does the money come from? You know, is it yeah. loans? And so on. So like by, by basically teaching journalists to look into specific questions and then look for answer, it kind of, it brings it closer to them. Um, yeah. And instead of, um, you know, using a complicated, you know, numbers explanation, you know, I tried to, do, to, te to, teach, it, uh, to teach it as yeah. if those were like just, the, you know, children who are le learning yeah. the very basic things. And, but and I remember they're able to see really amazing, they get, they get amazing findings. Yeah, Probably. and and I remember that in in this training course in Turkey, you actually taught a group of people, including myself. That was the first time that we learned the value of an Excel sheet, and you stayed for hours after that class, just helping all of us. So the the knowledge that you've imparted, um, I'm sure even you cannot quantify it, but it's really made a difference for how people understand stories. So a uh, question to Paul, Marina, and Miranda: How do you decide which journalists to bring on a project um, in terms of collaborating? Because of course there is the trust issue. Uh, there's the fact that every time you give someone access, people that have access through them, if they leave their computers open, it could endanger an entire project. How do you guys decide who to allow in and who to keep out? And how do you weigh that in the context of other issues? Well, you want to go first? I can follow it. Uh, I, I think you should go since it's connected to your presentation anyway. You, you mentioned some of it already. Sounds great. Um, you know, uh, at the beginning of, of the ICIJ, uh, we, uh, we, we were getting it a little bit wrong in that we thought that uh, we needed to, to do these investigations, we needed to invite all the star journalists in, in each country, like the journalists that, are, that were the most famous and had the biggest track records and had written a book. And uh, we realized on time that um, those journalists are sometimes the least motivated to collaborate because in some ways they feel like they have arrived already or they are just too busy, I don't know, leading a, uh, a media organization or writing their next book. So we changed our approach and we went for the journalists that are not only excellent investigators, but that are really, um, uh, that, that they have this mindset of a collaborator and are hungry uh, to work with others. Um, and, um, and, you know, so we, we started, we went from looking for like only the excellence in reporting to uh, looking and, and very, being very specifically about um, emotional intelligence. Can the person communicate? Yeah. Can the person, uh, uh, is the person self-aware? Um, is, is the person going to be able to function uh, in a team without putting others down? With, will, will somebody be able to go and, and do work and obtain records uh, or do analysis that is not going to benefit uh, her or his own story, but might, might benefit the work of other colleagues? Um, so that, that was a game-changing decision. Uh, it allowed us to uh, be um, much more inclusive and, and diverse uh, in the teams that we build. And uh, it, it just injected so much more energy uh, into these collaborations. So I think that, that, that was a, that's a big part uh, of um, how we go about uh, yeah, involving. Not everybody has, not everybody's built to be a collaborator. And I, I am grateful to some journalists that in the past have told me, you know what, um, I'd rather continue working on my own. That's how I have always done it. I respect that. Um, collaboration is, is hard, you know, and life is short. And so let's pick our partners really, really well so we can do all this like really hard work without having to deal with a lot of drama um, uh, in the process. 
Yeah. Um, so if I may um, just step back a bit. Um, if you remember the, the image that uh, Marina presented with the lone wolf, you know, that was a stage in investigative reporting. And then you have the gathering of fishes, you know, that, you know, kind of face the shark. Uh, this is like the, the, the second phase. It's, it's where we are right now. You know, we're dealing with more and more data and we're trying, you know, to coalize, you know, a, a lot more. But the reality is that um, that image, you know, with the shark and the, the, the lots of fish that coalized is just a fragment of the whole image because there are so many sharks out there in the oceans, in the oceans that are not tackled by any of this group of fish. So the reality of the thing is we are very few, you know? So when you, when you try to, you know, mount these big corporations, you know, it's, it's always with this um, sense of humility that you're tackling just part of the problem. And for that part of the problem, you got to find the right people. Yeah, as uh, Marina said, you know, you got to find people who are ready to cooperate, people who, you know, have the right set of skills like Miranda, you know, to be able to read a financial record to put things in context. You, you have to have storytellers as well. And all this. so this is always, always kind of hard to assemble. And, but I feel that um, you know, what we've done in the past decade is we've moved you know, through this second phase you know, a bit more and we understand it a bit better. It's, it's much easier right now to assemble a team of, 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 of journalists than it was like when, when we did the first Panama Papers you know, or the offshore leaks or others. You know? It's, it's, it's a lot easier because we have the technology. We know people who are willing you know, to work uh, in this way. Uh, and also I think one big, big win for these projects is that you know, they, they inspired people. They inspired other journalists you know, who are aiming right now to participate in this type of projects. So this is, you know, the group is growing. You know, that uh, gathering of fishes, that school of fishes, you know, it's, 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 it's growing, it's growing it's still not enough, you know? So it's, it will become harder and harder because the public notices, you know, it's like, if you look at the war on drugs, you know, the war on drugs, you know, this summer is gonna be like 50 years since it started. At first people had very few knowledge, um, very little knowledge about what was going on. And they thought, well, this is a good idea. You know, we're gonna fight drugs. We're gonna, you know, stop all, all this scourge. It turns out, you know, in 50 years, you know, We've done almost nothing, but there are lots of resources used and all that. So this is where we need to move with the journalism. We need to realize, you know, that this is a good model for now, but we do need to go somewhere else. You know, we, we do need to leverage more technology. We do need to inspire a lot more people. And ultimately, you know, we do need to dissolve investigative reporting into the larger society to be efficient. Which is something, Paul, that you, you all have done very well. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, the collaboration with other disciplines. So not just journalists collaborating with one another, but how do we collaborate with lawyers? How do we collaborate with advocates? How do we collaborate uh, with accountants? Uh, we don't have all the skills and all the tools that is needed to match uh, the forces we are investigating. Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're, you're right. And... On the other side, I mean, I, I think what we always have to weigh in is the other side. Who are they? You know, the criminals, the corrupt politicians, and they do have all these resources and they do have a lot of skill. I mean, some of these people, you know, that we're exposing are brilliant. You know, they could have been like amazing in doing good. They just, just chose, a, you know, like this other sort of path. But really, I mean, what we're tackling, you know, we're, we're dealing with immense resources. We're dealing, you know, with, with people who have at their disposal, you know, from secret services, if we talk about rogue governments, you know, to, you know, private companies that can employ people, you know, freelancers all over uh, uh, the world and, and such. So for them, it's much easier in a way to assemble their teams. You know, what we say at OCCRP is that it takes a network to fight a network. But the problem is there are so many networks out there that we need to fight that, you know, I mean, we got to start thinking a bit differently and, you know, indeed we need to, to go beyond journalism and to try to engage more people who are many times, you know, uh, smarter than, than we are, you know, people who are, who invested a lot of time in studying crime and corruption, you know, in, in, in studying supply chains, because that's where you make the difference ultimately. So I, I feel uh, it's a very interesting process, which is, you know, it's, so these are great times to, uh, to actually be a journalist. You know, but it's just the beginning, you know, which is actually thrilling. 
I just want to mention one more thing, which is about um, you know creating a new generation, especially in the in the places where it's increasingly difficult to work. You know, Central Asia is one example. We now see that it's becoming extremely difficult to be a journalist in Russia, and you know these journalists face not just a, a, you know possible arrest, uh, their families get harassed. You know, sometimes they get killed. I mean, there's like so much pressure on the journalists. And um, I wanted to, in a way, give a credit, but also um, to talk a little bit about our effort to basically bring, uh, you know, new reporters from ground up. And, you know, one sad thing is these reporters don't have their names on the stories, but they're like a silent force, which are being, you know, which are being grown in their own countries. And there are, you know, pa passing the passion and skills that they're learning from working with international colleagues to other reporters in those countries. And this is all happening in a way behind the scenes and people don't see it as happening, but there are stories coming out which are originally, you know, created by the reporters from these countries. And there are, those are strong investigations where with the major findings. And I think that's, that's a great thing because, you know, in, in five years, we will not need so many foreign reporters to report like about Azerbaijan because we will have amazing reporter in Azerbaijan doing exactly, you know, strong stories that will catch international attention. And I think this is like, this is really important for us, which, which have been uh, part of collaborations for so long to basically leave the legacy and create this new generation which will take over and do even stronger journalism than we ever possibly can. Yeah. Um, so, so just a quick question. If people are even handedly treating uh, leaks and scoops or stories that come their way, for example, by focusing on Lula's Labour Party, you kind of see the setup that it was a way to bring the Bolsonaro government in. How do you guys choose the big stories and leaks that you focus on? Are there some leaks that you will turn away by saying the consequence of exposing this will be much greater if another side comes into power? How do you fix on the leaks or the, the projects that you focus on? I can take on this, maybe start. Uh, it, it's, it's a very hard question, right? Um, I mean, look, um, at OCCRP, for instance, as ICIJ does, you know, we amass large, vast amounts of data, you know, many, many terabytes of data and from, you know, all over the world and, and such. So how do you use all that, you know, uh, in your reporting? Well, the answer is you don't because there's just too much, you know? So what we've tried, uh, the way we've tried to do things at OCCRP in order to be efficient and to serve the public in a proper way without being uh, too much influenced, you know, by outside forces is that we build up on our reporting. So we started, you know, looking at the offshore industry, you know, and all that about uh, 12 years ago, where, we dissected, you know, how this, you know, offshore type of infrastructure works, how criminal groups are using this type of companies, how they're using these bank accounts and, and so on and so on. And over the past 12 years and even more, we've learned, you know, more and more about this topic. So now we are, you know, able to report on these, on such issues, you know, of corruption, high level corruption and organized crime in a much greater detail than, than we were 12 years ago, which also means that because we're experts in this, in organized crime and corruption, it's harder for people to try to, you know, kind of influence our reporting. So uh, it happens, you know, um, at times to get information from tainted sources, criminals feed us with information. What we do is we, we sit down, you know, between editors, we look at is in the public interest, you know, and then of course, we start working on, on the issue, you know, again, always building up on the previous work. And then everything goes through filters, like, you know, from editing to fact checking, to lawyering to all these. So it's really, it's, it's hard to say, you know, that, you know, we're using all the information at our disposal because we're not. In reality, but what we're trying to do is to be as um, you know coherent as possible in what we do. We expose organized crime. Uh, we expose organized crime and corruption, and this is where we go. We don't suddenly start a completely different field of expertise where we don't have you know enough knowledge and all. If 
we want to tackle a new field, we talk to experts. If we want to tackle right now, and this is the case right now, uh, you know, uh, we make some forays into, you know, showing, you know, how organized crime and corruption is affecting the environment. But Marina and her group, they are experts in that area right now. So we would go to Marina for advice, for trying to find people to work with us and for, you know, issues to tackle so that we don't overlap, so that we serve the public in an efficient way. But this is a hard question and we always get critiqued, you know, um, by people who uh, tell us, hey, we sent you that data, you know, like two years ago and you haven't explored it. You haven't exposed these people, you know, these criminals, you know. Again, the reality is that we are too few for the amount of information that comes our way. And I think it's key to this to kind of try to change journalism in a way where, you know, you're not that much dependent on the source. So what, what I'm always saying is that we need to put a bit more science into investigative reporting, you know? Um, and I'll give you one example, you know, rather than going, you know, from, from a leak or going from someone who wants to influence you in some way, you know, because some bad did happen. Um, what you can do is you can automate the initial part of investigative reporting when it comes at least to organized crime and corruption, because crime and corruption, they are like commodity. They are, you know, they, there's an import export of these commodities across borders, you know, criminal schemes and all. So what you can do, once you gather enough knowledge, and you build templates, you know exactly how a crime happens, you know, you can use these templates, you know, from territory to territory to tackle the same issue that seems important to the people. You know, the fact that, you know, the organized crime loots countries of their resources, you know, and they're using, they're always using this, uh, you know, bank accounts based in, let's say, Azerbaijan and Denmark. And then, you know, they're using these companies based, based in Singapore. So once you identify this type of patterns, you know, you can apply this and you can share this with other journalists so they can go after the same issue without, you know, the source bias being, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, able to interfere with this. But again, I mean, for now, I think uh, it's a hybrid. We're relying a lot, you know, on human sources, but I think we need to go more towards the technology of, um, of all of this, because that's where you find the real issues, the systemic issues that you need to tackle, you know, and you need to tackle those in an independent way where people can't accuse you of, of that much of bias. Yeah. I Thank just you. Want to okay. Add very briefly, Khadija, on your on your uh, question, you mentioned Bolsonaro, Lula. What do we investigate? One of the, yeah. the beautiful things about these uh, leaks and Panama Papers and Paradise Papers was that they were absolutely bipartisan. They show us that everyone in that that the offshore world and that these schemes they touch everyone. They transcend mm. political parties backgrounds yes you have the usual suspects and all the, the criminal sub suspects were there and we certainly focus on them but there was also the queen of england and there was bono and there yeah. was the venezuelan opposition and the biggest trust that we found in the paradise papers it was owned by one of the biggest democratic donors in this country and so i think it was really and that, I think that made the journalism better because it helped us make the case of why this system is so central to the way our economy functions and why it's going to be so hard to eradicate uh, around the world, but especially here in the US. Yeah, I, I think what OCCRP and ICIJ did so beautifully was to show, as you said, how integral the system was in a technically legal way and how the same vehicles that corporate companies use are shielding criminals who camouflage themselves with it. And that's a, a very old story. So until the Panama Papers, you could say that even academics had not properly covered this. It was seen as marginal or exceptional and not central to the discourse. Uh, we have three questions in the chat box. One is, have some collaborators disappointed the trust placed in them and what sort of sanctions, if any, were imposed on them. The second question was, how do you ensure leaked data from an anonymous whistleblower is genuine so that we can confidently work on it? Uh, and, and I think what uh, Frederick is getting at is sometimes you can get a, a tranche of data and then a few sheets of that are buried inside and these documents might not necessarily be true. How do you verify it if the bulk of the tranche looks legitimate? And then a final question also sent in private is, how do you guys determine funders and funding? For example, with the Bill Gates Foundation, you see he's an intellectual property king. He dominates 
the, the health budgets of governments, WHO, as well as investigative media. And that kind of intellectual property system is exactly what has resulted in 1% of the world's COVID vaccines going to developing countries. So when do you turn away philanthropists who want to fund you? And when do you bring them on board? Any funder, CEDA, a government, the Gates Foundation, and so forth. Those three questions. I can go. I can answer quickly. Like, how do you um, uh, how do you deal when, uh, with issues of trust? I think the important thing is to, to prevent that from happening. As we said, by having very clear guidelines, by having by over communicating, and uh, and making sure that there are no uh, people in the in these collaborations that are just observing or taking and not being full collaborators. Uh, sometimes the trust is breached. Uh, um, I, I'm happy to report that in the ICIJ collaborations, we um, over the years achieved a you know, high level of success uh, and had like really minimum disruptions. And uh, when trust was breached, um, what we did is immediately remove that person from the collaboration and never collaborate with that person again. Uh, so that's, I think we, we all know going into these partnerships that um, it takes just one person, one weak link to compromise the work of, of uh, hundreds and, and to compromise journalism. Because if the Panama Papers had failed, if we had uh, exposed the, the whistleblowers, if we, you know, it, it would have been terrible for, for the future of journalism. And I think everybody had that kind of sense of responsibility and we kept reminding them and reminding them and reminding them. Uh, about the importance of confidentiality and the importance of being on the same page. Um, yeah, I, I can take um, yeah any any of the remaining two, but let's um, um, talk first a bit about you know um, uh, funding and funders. So. This is again, you know, like a very, very, uh, you know, delicate issue um, that we're, uh, you know, working with uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, there are, you know, from, you know, very, very dubious, you know, uh, bankers from, from Russia, let's say, you know, trying to, to sponsor us, to finance us, to, you know, uh, NGOs and foundations. Uh, some of, you know, some are, you know, based in Western Europe, in the US and, and such, these funders. Um, and um, if there are serious issues that, um, especially that affect the field, the field of journalism, and for us, you know, what's really important is for the funder not to get, uh, you know, not to interfere with our work, you know, not to inter interfere with uh, what, what we cover, how we cover things, you know, so we want, you know, complete independence because we're only working for the public, we're not working for the, uh, uh, for, for the funder. Um, so this is, you know, something that, you know, you grow these relationships over time with uh, uh, many of these, uh, of these funders um, to the tune that, you know, what we, what we make as an argument, even with, uh, with funders that sometimes don't really like us, you know, is that, you know, they ultimately gain from what we're doing, you know, um, Marina was showing how much money was recovered by governments as a result of Panama Papers. You know, um, as a result of our reporting at OCCRP, you know, lots of governments around the world, you know, um, recovered, you know, many billions. You know, and that's you know with a puny budget. So, investigative reporting pays off. It pays off big to the society. This is what uh, you know the argument that we're making with all these funders, and if they're not happy with their work you know, um, they can uh, cease funding us uh, and all. But the contracts that we draft always, you know, mention that we are editorially independent, that we should be allowed to do proper work in the public interest. So this is how we shield ourselves from, you know, the interests of the funders and, and all that. Now, this can always, you know, lead, you know, uh, to many, many other ways. You know, if you have funders that maybe have their private investments that are, not good in some way, you know, for the society. And, you know, uh, you mentioned Bill Gates and, and, and all, you know, uh, it's always difficult. It's always difficult. And we always have, you know, arguments and we, we always have discussions, but journalism, investigative reporting in general is underfunded. You know, we are very few and very much underfunded as well. So 
And we also, you know, again, don't take money from parties who want to fund us, who are, you know, there's lots of criminals and lots of other people with very shady interests. So it's always, it's about continuous dialogue and about making sure that what you're doing, the work you're doing is completely independent and in the public interest. Can I just okay, add and concretely uh, on that point, do you accept money from governments? And if so, uh, which governments have you accepted money from and how has that gone? Yeah, um, we do accept money from governments. Um, our main funder is actually the US government, but then we get uh, money from uh, about six or seven other uh, governments. Um, what we've done for the past six, seven years is we diversified quite a lot in our funding. We're trying to you know, move as much as possible from government funding you know, um, and go more for private foundations. Um, one of our, you know, like one of the private foundations that uh, funds us uh, since the beginning actually is the Open Society Foundation. So where you also have all these, these issues when it comes to, um, you know, uh, to attacks, uh, you know, um, on OCCRP. And so, but be it Open Society, be it the, you know, the Swedish government, CIDA is, is uh, uh, sponsoring us, you know, this is the, it's in the Swedish government equivalent of the USA um, and uh, other governments. We always make it clear, you know, we are an independent uh, uh, investigative reporting organization. We'll work in the public interest and that's it. So they don't have any say in our um, editorial decision and where we go. And what we do is we let our work speak for itself. We put our donors, you know, uh, on our webpage so that, you know, we're transparent about that and we let our work speak for itself. How, how do you guys handle running a leak or a story that you know will result in a lawsuit? I think OCCRP has won many lawsuits. Uh, ICIJ, we had Herb Falciani uh, on this pointer session, and he, of course, was talking about how the Swiss government hounded him. So how do you approach issues that you know will definitely result in a lawsuit? Go ahead, Paul. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, we've um, uh, we've had lawsuits. We we do have lawsuits. You know, we're sued quite frequently. We are um, um, defended by great lawyers too. This is a, a big component uh, with OCCRP. We have um, um, you know a group of lawyers who work with us, um, and we do lawyer our stories as well. We fact check. We lawyer them. So. We're trying to put, you know, um, uh, when we put out stories, we try to have them in the best shape possible. We don't put stories out if we have doubts, if something is not, you know, uh, uh, proven. Um, regardless, you know, you, you get sued because some of these people want to save face, you know, they want to harass you, they want to stop you from working. Uh, there are all these uh, uh, losses called slaps, you know, where people just um, sue you, you know, in uh, various jurisdictions like, you know, in London, just to make you pay a lot of money uh, with your defense. I was, you know, until uh, last year, I was um, uh, sued, in, sued in London by an um, uh, oligarch from uh, Azerbaijan uh, who worked with the, with the government there, who was also a member of the parliament. And it took lots of money to defend, you know, ourselves in, uh, in London. And uh, we're... Uh, we're actually facing right now you know i think about four lawsuits you know and this is this always comes down to the cooperation that we have with with the lawyers when you're sued the best weapon that you have as an investigative reporter is the truth on your side and your investigative capacity you know so what you start doing when you're in court is you investigate some more you know so that you present even more facts than you presented in the original stories with the court because that's how you win these cases. You got to have the truth on your side and you, ha uh, you have to have lawyers who understand not only media and investigative reporting, but understand how, you know, politicians and businessmen, you know, who are involved in various nefarious things, you know, work together. You know, they need to, to, to understand how these PR companies work in favor of oligarchs and in favor of criminals. So it's really about cre uh, creating this, um, cohesive team between investigative reporters and the lawyers that defend them in court 
And I've seen too many times, you know, lawyers who uh, just try to go to court and win the cases on technicalities. And that's, well, it's, it's how lawyers do things, you know, lots of times. But for investigative reporters, it's really best to win cases on truth. So the, the truth defense is the best. Now, if you're sued in a court where you know you can, uh, cannot win, this, this would be usually, you know, uh, in countries, you know, that don't have uh, democracy, you know, and where, you know, the, the, the judicial power is in the pockets of oligarchs, the power, powers of, you know, um, uh, various, uh, you know, criminals sometimes. That's, you know, somewhere where uh, you just know that you lose and you accept that and you just don't go there, you know, because, you know, uh, you put yourself in, in danger. So, but really, you know, it, it, it's, it's about, you know, creating this strategy, you know, where people in the organization feel safe working, feel safe investigating, because they know that there's, you know, the management of the company, the lawyers, you know, they have their backs. Whatever happens, they have their backs. I also, I'm just going to briefly add a couple of quick examples, uh, how collaboration also can help shield us from, uh, sometimes, from lawsuits or legal threats. When we were doing Swiss leaks uh, about HSBC, the bank, uh, I remember that at the time of getting comment from the bank, the Guardian went first and got uh, a, a terrible uh, a legal letter from the bank, threatening with an injunction and really denying everything basically that, that the Guardian was alleging. Uh, well, the strategy that we had designed was the Guardian would go first, uh, but then we will all need to send our own letters of uh, you know, comment. So after that response, letters started flowing to the headquarters of HSBC from literally all over the world, with journalists uh, um, asking them about the specific instances that they have found in their own countries. And that really was a, a game changing situation. It overwhelmed them, it really disconcerted them. And a few years, sorry, a few days later, um, the strategy changed completely where the bank not only uh, retreated from all the legal threats and the injunction threat in the UK, but also ended up admitting to us in letters that a high percentage of their clients in the years that we had investigated, in fact, should have never been their clients because they were criminals. And that, that was just astonishing to see in, a, in, the, in the matter of just a few days how the whole scenario changed when they saw that this was not just one newspaper in a difficult uh, you know, uh, uh, jurisdiction that they could take on, but these were hundreds of journalists everywhere from media organizations uh, across the world. Strength in numbers. So I want to bring you back to this triangle of considerations and see whether I can bring out a little more sharply the tension. I think uh, Khadija already alluded to it. So as I see it, there are three different things that you are concerned with and that you have to be concerned with in your work. One is your own survival. That is to say, you have to maintain your organization in existence. That means you need funding. And on an even more simple level, you have to keep your journalists alive. So you have to protect them. But funding is one important key thing. Uh, a second thing, of course, which you have emphasized a lot is the truth. Without fear and favor, you want to serve the public, as Paul has called it, and bring the public the truth, the full truth, and in an unbiased, impartial way. And then there's a third thing, which you could also put under the heading of serving the public, and that is the consequences of your work. So, and that's what I think Khadija had in mind with the example of Lula and Bolsonaro. So suppose you have a little sort of dirt on Lula and that dirt is interesting. It's certainly to, interesting for the public to know about, but it's also going to give Bolsonaro's people uh, the, you know, the people he had in the judiciary, an opportunity to exclude him from the next election with the result that Bolsonaro wins and hundreds of thousands of Brazilians die in this COVID firestorm. So anticipating that Lula will be a much, much better president than any feasible alternative to him, 
you might say, my responsibility as a journalist is to let this little dirt go by the wayside, uh, report by all means on Bolsonaro's dirt and the dirt on the right hand side of the political spectrum, but not on uh, little corruptions in the Lula camp because they will be blown out of proportion, they will be abused, it will have terrible consequences for Brazil. So my question is basically in this triangle of survival, truth, and consequences, how do you weigh them off against each other? Is this something that you struggle with? Uh, and if so, how do you resolve it? Um, I can maybe address it a bit if I, if I may, or if you, I, I feel like I'm, I'm also speaking too much. So Miranda, if you want to take this, feel free. Go ahead, Paul, and then later I'll give example of uh, uh, being responsible for revolution and that revolution not uh, being for the good of people in the end. So I'll, but first you start. <laughs> um, okay, um, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, La Bayato and, you know, these um, uh, scandals that have um, rocked Brazil, you know, for the past, you know, uh, years, um, I think, you kind of see an, um, an underlining theme there, and that's that unfortunately, most of the information that was uh, presented to the public in Brazil, not all of it, um, you know, some journalists did, uh, did amazing work, uh, but a lot of it uh, was fed by the law enforcement. Uh, prosecutors, you know, who leaked information to journalists and, uh, and such. And I think that's where the problem is, you know. Um, and it's not just Brazil. In many uh, countries, actually, uh, in mostly in mainstream kind of traditional media outlets, let's say, the investigative reporting is perceived as you know having good sources with the law enforcement. But that is that is just lazy. That is laziness. So when you're talking about this triangle, if you don't have enough work, investigative work, to determine the truth and to determine the gray areas as well, that's where you get into this type of, you know, um, outcome that's, you know, not very good. Now, as we'll, we'll hear from Miranda, there are things that you can't control. You know, you work in the public interest, you, 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 you get some, uh, a bit of information, you start investigating it, it pans out, you know, that, you know, that's, that's truthful information and you publish it, and then you really lose control of how, how that information is going to be used, you know, by the public, by the politicians, by various. This is why I, I think, you know, we, we got to change, you know, again, I, and I can't stress this enough. We got to change how investigative reporting is done. We got to put more science in it. And we got to go for much higher, you know, systemic kind of, kind of problems to investigate them properly. Not just say, I'm going to investigate, you know, the finance world, you know, but to actually understand it. And to understand, you know, how Lula and Bolsonaro are using the same system. You know, this is why at, at OCCRP we're doing a lot of this infrastructure type of investigations. And because this infrastructure is what serves everybody. This is where, you know, where the real problems are. And it, it, it doesn't matter if people are called Bolsonaro or Lula, you know, they are expressions of a system you know, and that's what's best to investigate. But even if you investigate like that, you know, ultimately there's another layer and another layer and another layer, you know, you know, you've had the national layer, you have the regional, you have the international, you know, uh, an investigation into the leadership of uh, Iran and showing how corrupt they are. Maybe it will trigger something in Iran, but will that be good for, you know, the fact that the US was just about to close a treaty, you know, peace treaty with, with, with Iran. You know, there's, there's lots of questions that are outside of, you know, uh, the power of, of, of journalism, you know. So what we do need to do is to feed, you know, solid information that people can use, you know, the citizens can use in their decision-making. That's, that's all we can do, but that doesn't mean we can solve the problems of the world, so, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I, so for the past two years, we did a lot of reporting in Kyrgyzstan. And what was really interesting about it, you know, we started with a story about, um, you know, custom scheme, which, which deprived the country of uh, $700 million. But then in the process as we were reporting it, our source was killed. 
Um, our reporters had read, we were forced to publish the story very quickly. And then the moment we published, uh, people took the streets and they were protesting. And um, I mean, the scenes were incredible. I mean, people were speaking out against the grand corruption, but nothing happened. You know, we kept reporting and then just before election and not on purpose, but it, you know, our stories were ready. We published a story about one of the, the, the guy who was responsible, who was running the big um, scheme and his in, in the customs and he was responsible for the looting of the state and you know his family became extremely rich so we published these stories and um, day after re revolution stories were uh, people were so angry because the political party backed by this powerful figure we exposed basically uh, used the vote buying and some other techniques to basically be win the second second place in the election and it literally led to revolution. And, you know, we were watching the scenes of, you know, them like going across the wall of the, pres you know, the presidential building, destroying server images, you know, the president like disappeared. Um, and then what happened, one of the guys who was actually in jail, um, you know, was allowed to go, you know, he was allowed to walk free. And literally by next day, the, the, the state was captured by him. He became like the new, you know, leader of the country. And, you know, this was something we could never have seen. You could never have influenced. Um, you know, now he just changed the constitution to give himself more power than any president in Kyrgyzstan ever had. And they had three revolutions so far overthrowing the presidents. Um, and all we did, and, and this is something that, you know, for as long as I'm, I'm being a journalist, the question we always ask ourselves is, does public need to know this? And no matter what other arguments are, you know, is our reporter in danger? Yes, we'll deal with this. Um, you know, is our source in danger? Yes, we will deal with this. But does public need to know? And they have been like so many situations. I mean, I remember just before we published that story, one of the sources to us came and said, please don't publish, you know, I'm in danger. And we had a very, very long, uh, this was a days long discussion, you know, thinking whether, you know, we don't publish. And we ultimately decided we do need to publish because you know we know what's the truth and we owe it to public to know and i think that's kind of been really like you know um our guiding thought you know we um we, you guys were talking about funding and whether you, we get the u.s government funding and i remember a couple of years ago we were doing this big investigation about arms mail arms mail uh, arm sales from Eastern Europe um, to uh, Middle East, basically, which were ending up in Syria and fueling the conflict in Syria. And one of the things, you know, we were funded by USID, which is US government. And one of our big story was $2.2 billion, you know, pipeline financed by US, you know, selling arms and, you know, bringing arms to Syria. I mean, that's what our story was. And, you know, we never thought about, you know, who is funding us or, you know, should we, or do we dare to publish the story? Our goal was, we, this is what we've seen taking place. And we felt this was something that, you know, public needs to know. And that really has been always the guiding force. You know, just a question, you know, does public need to know? I mean, it's as simple as that in the end. And being careful to write, to not try to be um, sucked into events or political events. Uh, we got a lot of grief in Argentina, my country of origin, uh, during the Panama Papers because the president-elect Macri was in the Panama Papers. We knew that president-elect, uh, that, pre that the future president was in the Panama Papers before the day of the election, but we were not set to publish until two or three months after uh, the election and we continued with that schedule. We did not break the story before the election to try to influence the election or to, you know, to try to, to tie ourselves to the news. And to some people that was disappointing, like uh, that maybe that information could have altered the course, of, the course of the election. And then there's the question of like, is it worth really risking an entire worldwide investigation and cutting these deals and making these decisions, um, or should we just stay the course, do our journalism and let the information come out when it's scheduled to come out, uh, rather than try to um, inject ourselves into an election process. Yeah, that, that position has a lot of integrity. Uh, we have one question, what is 
difficult lesson that all of you as leaders of your organization have learned. And then a final question from me. We see a lot of political sanctions against countries that don't deserve sanctions. And the sanctions really hurt the economies of these countries. Um, the question is, should every law or every sanction that comes from a first world country, often the war makers in the world, and who present themselves in very benign ways, should we report on those sanctions as if they are equal? Are all sanctions equal? Or sometimes uh, is this just a geopolitical war and we are feeding into an, a system of injustice by reporting on it as if it is true? Okay, I, I guess it's, it's my turn again then. Um, so on, on sanctions, um, Khadija, I think um, you're, um, you're exactly right. I mean, you know, um, and I think the worst thing that can happen, you know, is to apply this blanket type of section, uh, sanctions that, you know, affect populations um, and um, affect the general population actually and don't affect the elites at all. Because the elites, they always have the means to avoid this type of sanctions. Uh, now, there are other, uh, you know, uh, there's another category of, uh, of sanctions that's emerging, the Magnitsky type sanctions, you know, the Magnitsky Act in the US and similar acts, you know, in Europe and uh, other countries where individuals, people in power are targeted directly with sanctions. And I think those are, you know, uh, uh, better. Those are better because you don't have to sanction populations, you know, for the faults of, uh, you know, corrupt, crooked governments. Um, so that's that's one thing, and you know, and this is actually, uh, you know, if, if you ask, you know, what's what's one thing you you know I learned as you know um, uh, working with uh, with an organization like OCCRP, is that you always have to be you know open to learning some more. You always need to have doubts about everything you're doing because that's where you know the. Uh, the innovation comes along, uh, you know, it's, it's in doubts, it's in continuous discussions, you know, and fight sometimes with the other editors, with the other managers of the organization. That's where you grow. That's where you, you make your work uh, more interesting, you know. Journalism is not a cozy job at all. Journalism is about, you know, about understanding the world around you. And the moment you, you, you believe you figured out you know, everything, that's the moment you're dead as a journalist, actually. So for me, you know, this is the main lesson that, that we, I mean, I always learn and there's always something interesting that you can learn from everybody in the organization and beyond the organization. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, of lessons, I don't know if it is a lesson, but something that has been incredibly rewarding to see is that um, until not, not long ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, the field of investigative journalism was, was even smaller, much, much smaller than it is today. Yeah, the price of admission to be an investigative journalist was really high and was the privilege of a, of a few individuals, often men, and, and often from uh, you know, Western societies. And to see the explosion that we see now in part fueled and enabled by these large scale collaborations across borders and realize how much more diverse and inclusive the field of investigative journalism has become and how it's our colleagues in places like Miranda mentioned uh, in Central Asia, in Africa, in Latin America that are not only participating but leading and starting great world-changing investigations. Um, it's just incredible to see. And I think that journalism is, uh, is better for that. So I still have a small footnote question, if I may, and that concerns the funding. Uh, how much of your funding comes from governments and how much from the US in particular? Do you have a rough idea? Uh, you're asking me specifically? Both. Yeah, both okay. organizations. So at the Pulitzer Center, so just very briefly, the Pulitzer Center is an organi is a hybrid organization supporting journalism around the world, including giving financial 
grants to journalists uh, to report stories, as well as an education organization connecting uh, newsrooms and classrooms. Uh, uh, we raise money just like OCCRP raises money, and the majority of our money comes from foundations and individuals. But at this moment, we are receiving money from the Norwegian government for our uh, environmental work, which is uh, building a network of investigative reporters uh, focusing on the environment, corruption, and uh, tropical rainforests around the world. And we have the same kind of firewall that Paul uh, mentioned. Uh, one other thing that I would mention is that in some cases, we have managed to convince funders to instead of giving us money that would go directly to reporting, give us money that would go to the endowment of the, uh, the Pulitzer Center so we can sustain the Pulitzer Center for the future. And that was the case with Facebook. Uh, some journalists would be maybe wary of receiving, um, uh, knowing that their grant uh, is paid for by Facebook. And so what we did is um, Facebook did a significant donation for our endowment. And in perpetuity, every year we draw interest from that endowment and we devote it specifically to support local news in the US, enterprise projects and on news uh, in the US from that Facebook uh, donation. Um, and I don't want to quote wrong numbers or percentages for us, but I think um, about 60% comes from governments, most of it from the US government, but other governments as well. But again, you know, I don't have the data in front of me and the rest is private foundations, you know, I think. Okay, and it, uh, it basically doesn't lead to any kind of self-censorship or caution about how to treat stories or which stories to select. No, I, I think as Miranda mentioned, you know, we're, uh, yeah. we don't shy away from any story, you know. Uh, we, we do, you know, all the stories and again, we grow and grow and grow and really, when you investigate organized crime and corruption, you see the global system that's built, where you see oligarchs, you know, from the U.S. working hand in hand with oligarchs from Russia. It's is this layer that's not a national; it's a supranational layer, you know, that we're investigating, and that's where the big money is and the big problems for democracy are, and and, and all this. And this this is where where we are, you know, investigating and working hard. And, and there there are no impediments. I'll just mention one thing actually during the, I think it was Panama Papers or maybe Paradise Papers. We also don't shy away from investigating our own. Um, for example, one of our partners was Kiev Post um, and they found their owner in the data and they ended up investigating their own owner without owner being aware that they're investigating him and actually confronting him with the uh, information they found and publishing. So I think that that's, the, that's what good journalism is, because I think if you sell yourself once, you're sold forever. Um, and I think, you know, our, our currency is respect and the truth. And that's why we really need to do what is important story for public and serve only public and nobody else. And both um, companies associated to both Mr. Soros and uh, Piero Media that were both uh, supporters of ICIJ um, were all, you know, they were uh, part of the Paradise Papers, I believe it was. And so both uh, uh, the Soros organization and the companies being to uh, Mr. Omidia, they both received our uh, request for comment and these stories uh, were published. And they are also public on the ICIJ offshore leaks database, where you can see every name that has been associated to these leaks. And uh, the funding continued after those stories. And, and I'll mention one more example. We are actually currently working on a story where we received a leak uh, through our online leaking platform um, with uh, you know very deeming financial information, talking about money laundering and so on in one of the countries in Central Asia. And what was interesting, what was interesting for me, we were, uh, and not interested, but like part of our job, you know, we did our job and we checked, but we actually ended up discovering that, um, you know, money laundering did took place, but there's this whole other side of so story where this business uh, that laundered some money was also raided by some really bad people. And we actually are doing the full story, uh, even though the source and, you know, the source keeps writing to us and say, when are you going to publish, when are you going to publish? And we're just saying, we are investigating. And that's what we do. Even when we got information, no matter how, who is the source, you know, if we find the wrongdoing on the side of the source, 
you know, this is going to be the story. And, you know, that's what we are doing. We are telling the story of what is the truth to the best of our knowledge, you know, using all the checks we could possibly use to basically uncover it. Yeah, so basically in that triangle that I described, you are very, very heavily emphasizing the, the truth uh, corner of the triangle at the expense of both funding survival and consequences and faring pretty well with it, apparently. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, we can wrap up, but I want to make sure that everybody who has questions has had a chance to post them because it's a wonderful group of journalists who really are experts and at the cutting edge of investigative journalism today. So any final questions, comments, concerns, objections? So there's actually a question in the in the chat okay. about what is OCCRP doing to remain sustainable in the long run. Um, as the Pulitzer Center has an uh, an endowment, well, it, it's hard to build an endowment. <laughs> uh, that's for sure, you know, and that's uh, that's ideal. Um, what we're doing, uh, you know, um, we're um, and my uh, my my co-founder Drew Sullivan is working hard at it. It's um, we're trying to consolidate funding, first of all, to be able to protect against libel threats. So we have a rainy days fund, you know, um, where, you know, we defend and we help every OCCRP reporter journalist, you know, who's under legal threats. Um, these funds uh, are also used, you know, in order to help in situations where we have to extract people from dangerous areas where there's organized crime, where there's an immediate threat to, to journalists' uh, lives. So we do have these provisions, you know, um, uh, for the, you know, for these emergency kind of situations. And we work with many other organizations to put together an um, insurance pool for investigative reporters. There are efforts, you know, along those lines where we need to make this job a bit more secure than it is right now. We need to make sure, you know, no journalist working honestly, you know, loses their, you know, their income, their 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 livelihoods, and 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 all that. So this is something that um, uh, that we included with our strategy, with our longer term strategy. Of course, the aim would be ultimately to build an endowment, but before that, what we're trying to do is to diversify funding as much as possible, and to increase obviously funding. Um, and at the same time to take into account risk as we grow. The more efficient you are with your investigative reporting, the greater the risk. The greater sums of money you have to have at your disposal to defend yourself against these risks. Against legally, physically, lots of times, you, you have to provide, for instance, people with secure doors, you know, and systems, you know, to, to feel secure at home and in the office. These are big, big expenses, you know, and we take this into account as, as, as we grow. This is a primary concern for us to ensure the security of our people and because this is how you ensure the security of the, of the organization. And this, you, this is how you keep on serving the public. I just wanted to mention one more thing, which is what we're seeing uh, recently is that actually, um, you know, doing a good journalism ultimate results in a public support and uh, public coming to action, like at the difficult times. And one example definitely I can use is, uh, you know, we have a partner in Serbia called Creek, um, translated as Cream um, or <laughs> Network for Fight Against Corruption. And they have been severely attacked by the government and by the tabloids. There have been all kinds of uh, 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 lies spread around them. They were almost targeting them. Uh, you know, they were saying they were basically trying to embed them in the middle of the drug war uh, between two crime gangs. So it's been an extremely serious situation. And you know, public just came out in huge number in support, and they were donating money because they see how valuable what Creek does is. And you know, we have now a situation of unprecedented attack on Russian media. You know, one of them is, you know, Mendoza. Uh, they have been just declared a foreign agent, which basically means they cannot receive funding with every tweet of every story they post, they have to say that they're a foreign agent. And people have been responding. You know, they have been, you know, f sending money to them because, you know, suddenly Medusa is in a situation where they cannot receive any income. 
um, and make a living and public in Russia is reacting, they want them to stay alive. So I think in this situation, you can really see that the truth pays off in, in a way that you know public appreciates the work that the journalists do. Uh, it does, but if I may add to that, um, you know, it pays off at certain moments, you know, in time. Uh, I can give you the example, you know, um, of our member center in Romania, Rice Project. You know, donations from the public were increasing for a while, um, you know, because Rice Project wrote about the people in power. And these were very corrupt people. And, you know, Rice Project exposed them and all that, and it all went well with the public. And, but then these people lost the power and the other people came in power that were supported by this public. And suddenly, you know, when uh, Rice Project started exposing these other people who are now in power, the donations started decreasing. So this is, you know, a problem with, with, with public donations, you know, and this is somewhere where, you know, the, the public is so, so polarized that they, they can't really see the value of the journalistic act in its, you know, correct sense, because they kind of perceive you as their allies for a while. And then when you switch, you know, because there's other people in power and you got to investigate the power, you know, then you actually suddenly become enemies, <laughs> you know? And this is why this, you know, there's always, it's always better to have a hybrid kind of model of funding, you know, where you, you know, rely, you know, a bit on foundations, money and governments, and then, you know, the public, uh, you know, crowdfunding and things like this. But it's difficult. It's always about juggling between these, um, these uh, issues. Is there perhaps reason to introduce into the collaboration that is emerging among journalistic organizations worldwide a financial element so that instead of only collaborating about how to process data and tell stories, uh, you might also support each other in emergencies where a particular journalistic organization is running out of funds or is under particularly harsh pressure, let's say legal pressure and so on in particular countries. So this is the whole OCCRP model. This is, you know, the member centers that are part of our investigative platform, they benefit, you know, uh, we, we fund them whenever they have the need, not just for the reporting, but when, when they're under legal threat, when they can't pay the salaries of their people and all that, this is our whole model. Yes. You know, right. you, you gotta take care of the network to be able to report in a network. Very good. If there are no more questions, comments, concerns, then I think we wrap it up here with heartfelt thanks to all of you for uh, a really interesting session, I think, very illuminating session from uh, the front lines of investigative journalism. I can only say it's an admirable job that you are doing and uh, obviously a very challenging one as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Khadija. Also, she is uh, she has very loudly barking dogs in the moment, which make it a little hard for her to come into the conversation. And uh, see you all perhaps on Tuesday at three thirty. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having. They just watch dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye.